I was born in Colombia, in the capital, in Bogota. From my childhood, for all of my life, I lived in Colombia until I was 35 when I got married. My story began when I was 25 years old. So I was studying in the university. I was studying tourism administration, which was my first career. I went to the university, and on the day that I caught that bus, I never imagined that it would be my last day to be alive. I mean, I never imagined that I would have an accident that day. Every day it was my routine to catch a bus to go to the university. So I'd do my daily routine at the university, uh, take my classes, do my practical studies, and then return to my house. So that's what I did. I went, I caught the bus, I said to the man, the driver, to stop at the corner. The buses in Colombia have two doors, one in the front and one in the back. I went towards the one in the back, and I signaled the driver with the little bell by the door. There's a little bell to let the driver know you want to stop, and uh, I rang the bell. I thought he had told me that he was putting down the steps in the back, but actually he didn't see me. He turned the wheel sharply to the left because the traffic light was yellow. I mean, he should have stopped, but he didn't want to. He wanted to get through the yellow light. So he got through the yellow light, and right then the door opened, and the force of the bus turning pushed me out. It pushed me out onto the street outside. I fell right on the street, and at that moment when I fell on the street, I wasn't aware of anything. The only thing I knew was that there was a voice from a lady that said, You killed her! Uh, she said, you killed her. And I said, what's happening to me? I don't know what's happening to me. Immediately in that moment, I left my body. And I saw a group of people standing over me and around me and a, a pool of blood around my head. I mean, a really big pool because I had fractured my head. And immediately I began to rise or to float away, away from my body. And I saw everybody there around me. I saw the people, the houses, the roofs of the houses. I passed through the clouds in an instant and went even higher than the clouds. I left the earth. When I left the earth, I could see it. I could see the planets. I saw Jupiter and Saturn uh, and even Mars. I mean, I saw the entire universe. It really rattled me because I didn't know what was happening to me. But I felt a good sensation. That is, it wasn't a bad sensation. I felt good, like my spirit was floating. And I didn't feel the heaviness of my flesh. You know, it's kind of hard to explain. But that's how I felt when I left my body. Right away, I saw the entire universe. It was like in just milliseconds. Immediately, I went through a tunnel. And in the tunnel, there was no light. It was completely dark. It was as if I had entered a cave. It was a totally black cave. I couldn't even see the palms of my hands. I, I didn't see my body. I could tell that I was passing into another realm that I hadn't experienced when I was alive. And I said, am I alive or am I dead? I touched the palms of my hand, and my fingers went right through my hand, as if it were transparent. My hand went out through the other side, and I knew there was no flesh. I mean, I didn't touch actual flesh. So I said, am I dead, or what's happened to me? Right then, I felt a presence, voices behind me. They, they began to make fun of me. They began to laugh at me and say nasty things about me. They said, you're a bad person. You're just the worst, and you deserve to be here. So I said, who are you? But they didn't say anything to me. They just laughed. They said, ha, 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 and they made fun of me again and again, and they laughed at me. 
and they kept coming closer to me. I tried to hear these presences or spirits because I was very afraid. It felt like they were, like they were monsters. And the problem was that when they tried to get close to me, I tried to pass them on the right side. I tripped, but then I ran to the front and to the left. But I ran into another wall, and that's when I realized I was in a tunnel. At the back of the tunnel, behind me, I saw a fire, or I, I mean, I felt the heat of the fire, of the flames. I felt and I heard screams that were like someone was being tortured. These people were being tortured. I heard those screams and I was very afraid. I just didn't know where I was. So I said, where am I? Where am I? And they said, don't you know? And I said, no, I don't know where I am. And they said to me, you are at the gates of hell. And when they said that, I was in complete shock. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. But I said to them, I can't be at the gates of hell. I'm a good person. I can't die. But they said to me, no, you are dead. And you're going to be here in this place forever. You're never going to have any other type of existence. The only future existence for you will be in this place, in this place of torture. You're going to be tortured for all time. We're going to be torturing you all the time. And I said, how are you going to be torturing me? I don't get it. And then they grabbed me and they pulled my arms. They began to scrape at the flesh of my arms. They had fingernails that were horribly long. So when they grabbed my arms, each arm, it was as if they were skinning me alive. It was terribly painful because when you're dead, you feel things more intensely than when you're alive. The senses become more acute. You feel the physical pain more intensely. And you smell odors more, more strongly. I smelled the overpowering odor of them because they were pure death. They smelled like dead rats. It was a horrible smell. And I knew I was in an ugly terrible place. And I said to them, get away from me. Please let me go. But they didn't want to let me go. The only thing I could think of, because, well, at that time I was a Catholic. I went to the Catholic church and I figured that was good enough. To be Catholic was, for me, the best. The church in which I grew up as a child, I mean, I grew up in a Catholic family. I went to church every week. I went to church on Sundays, too. But I didn't study the Bible or anything. I didn't actually read it. I just listened to the message, and I read the part that the priest gave us in the message. I didn't study the Bible deeply in any way. So I was a Catholic who went to church and appeared to be a Christian. I mean, I wasn't really a Christian. It was just an obligation that I was supposed to go to church on Sundays. But that's all there was to it. No more than that. No more than that. Now my house was full of statues. I had the Virgin Mary. I had St. Teresa, St. Martin of the Poor, uh, St. Gregory. And my mom, well, she died when I was very young. She had an illness, and she was always praying to the saints, hoping that they would cure her of her disease, which she had in her leg. She had a lot of statues of St. Gregory, who was supposedly a doctor or something like that. We idolized the saints, supposed saints. We idolized them a lot. And the most important of all was the Virgin Mary. I grew up adoring, almost to the point of worshiping, the Virgin Mary. I believed that the Virgin Mary was someone very special. What happened in hell was, when I was there in the tunnel, was that these evil presences told me, you didn't satisfy the commandments of your God, and that's why you're here, because you didn't satisfy the commandments of your God. And I said, but what are the commandments? I don't know which commandments I didn't fulfill. 
Why do I deserve hell if I haven't killed, I haven't stolen, I haven't engaged in fornication or, or anything? You know, I thought everything was fine in my life. But I had done other things that were not in alignment with the commandments. So then, what happened? Right then, when they were torturing me and skinning me, the only thing I could think of was the Lord's Prayer. You know, the Lord's Prayer in the book of Mark in the Bible. So I said to myself, I'm going to pray. That's what I need to do. So I began praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And each time that I said something, the demons tortured me more and more. And they scratched at me more. And I screamed from the pain. But I said, no, I insisted I'm not going to stay here. I know that there's a God that's going to forgive me. I know there's a God that's going to have mercy on me. He's going to forgive me, and he's going to take me out of this hell. I cannot stay here for all of eternity. I can't stay here forever. And I continued and continued and persisted until I finished the Lord's Prayer. And when I finished the Lord's Prayer, I remembered that the only name that's above all earth and even the universe is the name of Jesus. So I said to them, I know there's a name that's above all the earth and the universe that is more powerful than you. And I'm going to pray to that name that he takes me from here that he pulls me out of this hell. And they said to me, no, 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 you're going to stay here. You have no hope. You're going to stay here for all eternity. But I said, no, I know that if I call on him, he will hear me and he will save me. So I began, I said, Jesus, please save me. Please save me. Nothing happened right away. The first time, nothing happened. The second time I said, uh, they said, no, they kept saying no. You are not going to leave here. You will remain here for all time. But I said, I am leaving here. And the second time I called out, Jesus, please help me. I beg of you to forgive all my sins, all the bad things that I have done in my life. Forgive me. I repent of all the bad things I've done. If I've treated someone badly, if I've forgotten one of your commandments, if I've not done something from your commandments, Please forgive me and, and show me what path I should take, what I need to do to make my life holy and to be able to be in your presence. I don't want to stay here. And then I said again, Jesus, please save me. But again, the second time, nothing happened. The whole time I was crying out to God for mercy, they were pulling me back and back towards the back of the tunnel. They were going to throw me into the fire, the eternal fire. I felt that I was going to burn. I was already beginning to feel the burning from the fire. I felt the flames all over my body almost. And the only thing that I could say was, Jesus, I promise to follow you for all my life. All my life, I will follow your word. I will follow you, and I promise to be faithful to you. But please give me one more chance, one more chance to live and to be able to change my life. God, please save me. Save me from this place. And at that moment, shoo, the demons just left me. They, they left me free. And I said, wow, what is this? Something had happened, and I wasn't in the tunnel anymore. The tunnel just sort of opened, and there was a spectacular pathway. It was like if you went into a garden, and it was full of flowers, glorious flowers, precious flowers. I mean, never in my life have I seen flowers like that. It seemed as if they were dancing, dancing, and at the same time singing. They were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the Savior. Blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ. To him belong all the honor and glory to our Lord Jesus Christ. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. I mean, I felt the love of God towards me, as if God were embracing me and saying, I love you. And I felt a presence so large that I drew back and, and I began to cry. I cried and I cried because I felt that I did not deserve to be there. I felt that actually I did indeed deserve hell. And you might say, why did I deserve hell? Because I was not clean, right? My heart was not clean. My feelings were not right. I had done many things that God was going to reveal to me. They were the bad things that I had done. At that moment, 
I continued walking because the path was spectacular. It was as if I went towards a waterfall, and I saw at the source of the waterfall a very handsome, um, crystalline figure, like the water that fell, and I felt that it was cleaning me. It was cleaning me and washing me of all the dirt from my past life. I felt that all that water was washing me, cleaning my life, my heart, my soul. And then I felt peace. At last, I felt an incredible peace, a peace that I had never, never in my life felt. I had never felt a peace like that. Never again would I feel a peace like the one I felt when I was in the presence of God. I felt the love of God towards me. And he said to me, my daughter, you know, at that moment, Jesus appeared before me and he said, stop, stop for a moment, just wait. So I stopped and he said to me, you know where you were going? And I replied to him, yeah, to hell. Yeah, you are going to be condemned to hell. And I said, but why? If I was supposedly such a good person, I mean, I went to church and I took communion, I confessed and all that. And he said to me, wait, I will show you your life. So you know what happens next? He shows me my life in a movie, like in a movie that you watch in the theater. And he starts to explain to me, do you see this part here when you were 10 years old? You were bad because you lied to your parents and told them that you were going to do one thing but you did something else. That seemingly little lie is a big lie here. It's a great sin. I never imagined that by telling lies that thinking bad things about someone else, a friend or something, was a big sin in heaven. It is a big sin in heaven. And he said to me, the worst part is that you idolized my mother, the Virgin Mary. And I replied, well, yeah, but is that bad? And he said, yeah, this is very bad because you should not idolize anyone, no saint, not even my mother, because the only one who deserves the honor and the worship that you want to give is to me. And the glory is to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because we are three in one person. And he said to me, you only should give honor to God, not to the Virgin, not to the other saints or other images. And I said, oh, right, Father, you are so right. And he said, another sin for which you were condemned was the worst sin for which you were to be condemned to hell was to not forgive. And I said, who didn't I forgive? I don't know who I didn't forgive. And he said, you know who you didn't forgive. And I said, my stepmother? And he said, yes, your stepmother. And I said to him, but it's that she killed my mom. I know she killed my mother. And I said to him, she practiced witchcraft. She put pins in the dolls. That's voodoo. And he said to me, yes, she is a witch. She is a witch. And I said, she killed my mom because I found a doll with the pins in it when my mom died. And then later, my dad married her. And I knew that my stepmother had hatched this plan in order to be able to be with my dad. So I had this resentment towards her in my soul. I had resentment towards my stepmother, and I felt that, <coughs> excuse me, this was the resentment that I had, and I just couldn't forget that about her because she had killed my mother. And for me, that was the worst thing possible. I mean, why would she kill my mother in order to be with my dad? I mean, it wasn't fair because I was an only child at that time. I didn't have any brothers or sisters. The only person in whom I could confide was my mom, my friend and my mom. And then she took my mother away from me. So I was left without mother, with only my dad. And I didn't have any brothers or sisters, so I felt very alone. All through my adolescence, it was a very sad time because I didn't have anyone in whom I could confide my secrets, with whom I could share the things that were important to me, because I didn't have a mom. I mean, my mom died when I was 15 years old. So shortly after I graduated with my high school degree, my mom died, unfortunately. And it happened because of the witchcraft that my stepmother perpetrated against her. So what happened? At the moment that I died, I felt that resentment eating me up, 
It's like if you have something that you just can't get rid of, you can't get it out of your heart. It's a bitterness, a bitterness that hurts you, that, that saddens your life. And he said to me, that was your greatest sin, and for that sin you were condemned to hell. And I said to myself, wow, oh, you are completely right. I deserve hell. Unfortunately, we think that not forgiving is just a small sin, but actually, it's an immense sin. And it says in the Bible, brothers and sisters, it says, if you do not forgive your brother, you will not be forgiven. That is, God will forgive you if you forgive your brothers. It doesn't matter if they have killed your mother or if they've done something to you or your family. It does not matter. You have to love them. And it says you should love your worst enemy. That's what it says. And that's what God told me. You have to love her. You have to love her and forgive her. Because if you do not forgive her right now, I'm going to send you back to hell. And I was like, no, 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 Lord. I promise that I will forgive her. I do not want to go back to hell. And then he says to me, okay, you really need to forgive her from your heart. And in that way, you can stay here. Or you can go back to earth. I'm going to let you choose. Either way, you can stay here or you can return. And I thought, I don't know what I want to do. I mean, I want to stay here. I would like to stay here. I mean, being in heaven is really satisfying. You feel like, like a love that you have never seen ever in your life. It's a love. It's a peace. It's a divine tranquility. You are without any preoccupations, with nothing that makes life bitter. It's to feel completely happy, to feel the joy of God. And I said to God, I would like to stay here, but send me back to earth so that I can show my dad. He showed me a vision of my dad. I mean, it's like he gave me an image of my dad and showed me that my dad was suffering. He was crying about me because, you know, I, I had died. And he was suffering so much because of me. And so I said to God, no, I want to go back because I need to take care of my dad. I'm the only daughter, and I think I need to go back. I have a purpose to fulfill, to go back and take care of my dad. And the Lord said to me, that is a good reason to go back. But tell me what other reason you have that I should send you back. And I said, well, because I want to have a family. And he says to me, yeah, that's a good reason, a family. And I said, yeah, I want to have some children. <laughs> and he says to me, okay, that's good. That's the second very good reason. You are going to have a family and a husband, but it won't be until several years after you return to earth that you're going to have the opportunity to have a family. And I did not know why. I said, why am I going to wait so long to have a family? And he said, because you have to learn first to read my word, to learn my word, to study my word, and to walk according to my word. And you have to be born again. And I said to him, Lord, how can I be born again? I don't know how to do that. I mean, Catholics don't know anything about how to be born again. I mean, I was born. I was baptized. What else do I need? And he said, no, you need to be born again and baptized again. But this is in order to live a Christian life, to live a life in Christ with me, so that I will be by your side. And I said to him, oh, okay, now I understand. But I don't understand very well how I'm going to do that alone on earth. Who's going to help me? Who? And he said to me, don't worry, my daughter. I'm going to help you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to be with you right at your side. I'm going to be right with you, always accompanying you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm always going to be at your side. And I said to him, okay, Lord, that's good. But why do I need to wait to have a husband? And he said to me, until you turn your life around and make a 180 degree change, I am not going to give you a husband. You need to completely change the way you live, the way you do things, the way you go about life. Because, you see, in my Catholic life, I had gone to the disco, I had gone dancing, I drank. I, I wasn't an alcoholic, but I'd have my beer, my wine, you know. Things that don't matter if you're a Catholic. You can go to parties. It's not bad. Uh, you can have a boyfriend. It's not bad, right? But 
If you're a Christian, it's different. If you're a Christian, you have to be very upright in the way you live. You need to be pure like God. Because does, God does not call us to be perfect, but He does call us to be saints. But I didn't understand that. I did not understand what that was. I really didn't get what that meant. And I said to him, no one has taught me how to walk in the Word. Nobody has explained to me what that means. And he said to me, don't worry, I'm going to direct you to a church where you can learn my Word. And I was like, okay. And he said to me, if you were to enter heaven here right now, you'd be arriving by the skin of your teeth. And I said to him, why? And he said, you'd only be entering by the skin of your teeth because you haven't won a single soul to me. And I said, wait, what do you mean, win a single soul to you? And he said, when you win souls, you earn crowns. And I was like, oh, and the crowns. And I said, Jesus, what are the crowns? And he said, the crowns that you earn here in heaven are when you share the gospel or evangelize and share my word with someone who has never known me, never heard of me that has no idea what the name of Jesus Christ is. So when you talk to that person about me and tell them what happened to me, that I sacrificed myself for all of you, that I paid the price of sin on the cross, and when you show that person what it is to change their life, that they should give their life over to me, is when you have won for me, that is when you have earned a crown in heaven. And I was like, wow, that's quite a job. And he said, yeah, it is a big job. This is your new ministry. You have to learn to begin to disciple people. And when you begin to do that on earth, to disciple, is when you begin to earn crowns. And you begin to build your house, the mansion in which you will live in heaven. You begin to build it while still on earth, when you win souls for me. And I was like, Oh, I never knew that. I had never been in the presence of God before that moment. You know, if I had not died, I would not have known that this even existed. I would not have known that I had to work to earn crowns in heaven. And that's what I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, that I have many sins for which I am condemned. But the worst of the sins for which I was being condemned was the idolatry and unforgiveness Unforgiveness was the worst sin that he showed me. But also, in addition to that, there were the sins of not serving. And he said, you were not serving people. You were not humble. And you have to be humble before the Lord and humble before your brothers and sisters. And he said, you have to be humble and serve people and begin to love people like poor people. Actually, it doesn't matter if they're poor or rich, but you have to begin to give of yourself to them in order to serve them. That is, you need to give of yourself to serve people, those who are orphans, whether they're widows or widowers. You need to visit the elderly, those who are in their later years. Give them love. Give them things that they don't have because they don't have a family. And you have to begin to show love to people on earth because the only opportunity that you have to earn crowns is to do what I'm telling you. And that is what I want you to do. I want you to begin to show love to people, things that you have never done in your life as a practitioner of Catholicism. And I said to him, yeah, you're right. I've never done anything like that as a Catholic. I never had any thoughts of serving people like in a Christian church. And as a Catholic, I wasn't particularly concerned with that because as a Catholic, I was just concerned with dressing nicely or being in the best high school or college or being fashionable or watching movies. And all that, I thought it was just fine. I mean, it was good. That was all wrong. The sin that I harbored in my life was living a mundane life. It was a great sin. Later, he told me, okay, I'm going to send you back to earth. But before I send you back to earth, you have to know that you have a purpose. And that purpose is what I'm going to explain to you now. Your purpose is to give your testimony to everybody that you come in contact with on earth and tell them that there is a hell and there is a heaven and that hell is real and that heaven is real and that if you commit even one sin, you're going to go to hell. That is, if your brother does not follow the Ten Commandments, he will be condemned to the fires of hell. 
And it's very sad that there are so many people that will be condemned to hell because there are thousands and thousands of souls in hell. I mean, it's a horrible place to go for committing even one single sin. And brothers and sisters, I need to tell you, this is not a place that human beings deserve to go. I mean to say, it's not a place people want to go after they die. I mean, the place we want to go is heaven, not hell. And I beg you right now, brothers and sisters, that if you know that you're committing a sin, that you repent today of that sin, of whatever failing that you have as a human, and that you give your life to Jesus Christ, and that you begin to live your life as Jesus Christ, that you sanctify yourself, that you sanctify your life and give the best of yourself to people to try to live an upright life, not a life of sin, because a life of sin is going to lead you to hell. And then after that, God told me, I'm going to send you back to earth. But when you return, you're not going to remember much. You're not going to remember certain parts because I'm going to erase some things that happened from your mind. Because if you remembered the images of those monsters, those demons, you wouldn't be able to live your life and be sane. You'd have nightmares every night. So I'm going to erase that part from your memory so that you can survive. But I'm going to leave certain parts so that one day you will remember all that happened in one single dream, in one moment of your life, when you have given your heart to me, when you have truly been baptized, when you have made the decision to follow me 100%, that day I will give you a dream so that you can know or remember what happened and so that you can give your testimony to all people. So what happened, brothers and sisters? I returned to earth and I was, you'll never guess where I was, in the morgue. I mean, really, in the morgue. I was completely covered with a sheet, and the morgue attendant was taking notes about my condition because I was dead. And then I woke up. The technician, she came when I removed the sheet, and the nurse let out a little yell like, what, what happened? And I said to her, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I'm alive. And she said to me, but you were dead. And you've been dead for an hour. I was dead for a whole hour. And I said, well, I know that I was in the presence of God, that it was him who returned me here. And I know that it was Jesus who gave me the opportunity to return now, to return to live here on earth for a purpose. But I didn't remember anything, brothers and sisters, anything else that had happened right at that moment. The only thing that I could remember was that I had been in the presence of Jesus. And it is a presence that you never forget. It is super beautiful, the presence of Jesus that I felt during the time that I went to heaven. Heaven cannot even compare to earth. There isn't a place more beautiful than to be in heaven, in the presence of God the Father, and above all, to see Jesus. I'm telling you, Jesus, you can't even see his face because it's pure light. It was pure light that came right out of his eyes. I saw his robe his white robe that was beautiful, and the sash that he has, and it was a purple color, and his sandals that were of gold, and his precious feet that had the marks of the crucifixion, both in his hands and in his feet. It's incredible, but one simply melts in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's something absolutely, incredibly beautiful. And never again could I continue living the way I had been living before being in the presence of Jesus. That is, to be a Christian is a promise. It's a promise with yourself as a person in order to better your life, to follow the Ten Commandments, to make it better in every way. That is, to give the best of yourself to others and to God as well. To give the best of yourself to God because God is in you. Jesus is in you. And through Jesus, we can do all things. And at that moment, when I returned, it took three whole months to recuperate. My head was like three times the size of a basketball. I mean, imagine, three times the size of a basketball. It was just huge, gigantic. My head was completely shattered, and the doctor said to me they took x-rays, they took an electrocardiogram, they took any number of encephalograms of everything. And they said, 
We have no idea how it is possible that you are talking, that you have coordination of movement, because anyone else who had gone through what you've been through would be in a vegetative state. They would not be able to talk. They would not be able to walk. They wouldn't be able to do anything. They would only be able to be in the presence of God. The infinite love that he has towards us is that he returned me completely healthy and sane, completely, without even one, um, how can I put it, he didn't leave me with any damage at all, any brain damage. Supposedly, I lost a lot of blood, but I didn't have any um, brain damage. I didn't have any other fracture. I mean, everything was normal. The only thing was that my head was enlarged. But the rest, the doctors did not understand. They could not explain how it was that I could be alive. So in reality, this was a miracle. And I believe that it was a miracle because God returned me healthy and whole here to earth. Well, I returned to have a second life, but my life is completely changed. Completely. I feel that I had this desire for God to learn more about his word. And I began to read more. I began to study the Bible more. And I began to attend a Christian church. Well, actually, I went back to the Catholic Church and the Christian Church at the same time. It was like I was still not convinced that I had to change my environment, my religion. But I felt that call, that God was calling me. And I said, okay, I don't know what it is. Until at last, after several years, I met a girl in college. I had changed majors, and that second major that I had was business administration. And in the second major at the university, I met a person who was a Christian, a girl. And she invited me to a conference, a, a revival, a Christian revival meeting. And she said to me, hey, you want to come to my church? And I was like, yeah, I'd love to go to your church. And I went. And when I went, oh, I never would have changed like I did that day. That day, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me, and I fell to the ground, and I began to cry and cry and cry and cry, and I couldn't stop crying. And it was the presence of the Holy Spirit that, in that moment, was surrounding me, enveloping me. And I said to her, wow, why am I crying so much? And she said, it's the Holy Spirit. And I was like, okay. And I said to her, I want to be baptized. I need to be baptized. And she says to me, sure, you can be baptized, but you need to complete a course. And I said, all right, I'll take the course. And I began to take the course to be baptized. It lasted, I think it was about 15 days, this course. And after the course, I confirmed my decision to be baptized. And when I decided to be baptized, what happened? At that moment, uh, well, let me back up. The night before the baptism, I felt a presence that was suffocating me. It was at about 1 o'clock in the morning, and it was completely dark in my room, in my house in Colombia. And I felt like someone was suffocating me, as if someone was trying to drown me. And the only thing that I could say was, Jesus, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you, presence, demon, whatever your name is, who comes out of the pit of hell, you have to leave now. You must leave me. You can't harm me. You can't. You don't have the authority to kill me because greater is the presence of God in me than you in me. You have to go right now in the name of Jesus. And I said it like that with great assurance. You go, demon, go. And immediately he left me. I didn't see him, but I felt that it was a demon that was drowning me, that was suffocating me, that was killing me. And while all this was happening, my room was completely dark because it was night. It was one o'clock in the morning. And I felt this that appeared, a white light, or that is, my room just kind of lit up with a white light, a brilliantly white light. And I sensed this smell of, of jasmine, like flowers. And I said, wow, this smells like heaven. And I again felt the presence of heaven. But so great was the impression that I closed my eyes. And I know at that moment, Jesus was right in front of me. And I didn't want to see him because of the intensity of emotion that I was experiencing. Because he saved me for a second time, brothers and sisters. For the second time, he saved me from death. And when I opened my eyes, he had already gone. But I knew that Christ had been in front of me. And Jesus saved me for the second time because the demon would have killed me. And brothers and sisters, there have been many things that have happened throughout my life when a demon has wanted to attack me, 
or, or kill me because of my testimony. But today is a big day for me. It's a challenge to tell you this testimony today in front of the Latino community, the English community, and the European community. And I want you all to share in this testimony and to know that God is alive. God is the God of yesterday, today, and forever. And that if you accept Jesus, you will bring into your life peace. You're going to live a life of peace, a life that is truly upright. But if you do not make the decision to accept Jesus in your life, you will not have peace. You're not going to have the opportunity to go to heaven. You're going to go to hell. It's the only opportunity, and I beg you that you see what happened to me is certain. It's real. So whatever person, anyone who has been in my shoes, that has had the experience that I have had, can have the same experience. But if you repent now, brothers and sisters, it's the way that you can avoid going to hell. And I beg you right now, at this very moment, that you have the opportunity to give your life to God and that you pray a simple prayer and just say, Lord God, forgive me for all my sins, for all my iniquities, for all the bad things that I have done, for all the bad thoughts that I have had throughout my life, for all the faults that I have committed against my brothers and my sisters, against myself. I beg you, Holy Father, that you forgive me all those sins from the bottom of my heart and that you give me the opportunity to enter into and live in your glory. Let me begin to live with you, Lord, and I open the doors of my heart, and please enter me to live in me and to dwell with me. I accept you, and I promise to follow you for the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.